Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about how I created an entire TV show by myself using Moho with Kilian Muster. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that we'd like to go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Question and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. The recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Mario Quinones, myself, Victor Paredes, and Kilian Muster. For those of you who join us for the very first time or have never heard about, list, about Moho, Moho is your only one animation software. Moho is a powerful 2D animation software that combines the most powerful animation technology with state-of-the-art professional animation tools. Draw, ring, and animate easily. You can create your character directly in Moho with its vector tools optimized for animation or import images or Photoshop files, keeping the link and layering structure. For more information, visit mohoanimation.com. Also, to participate actively in this webinar, you can share your Instagram story and we'll share it as well. If you tag as hashtag uh, webinar, hashtag mohoanimation, at Kilian Muster and at Moho Animation. And now I will leave Kilian in his presentation how I created an entire TV show by myself using Moho. About the presenter, Kilian has been working as a designer in many fields but has been dreaming of producing his own film since his childhood. He first used Moho to create an animated TV commercial in 2001, Moho 2.2 first Mac version, and for smaller side jobs afterwards. After leaving the video industry for decades, he remembered his own love for film, animation, and storytelling right in the time for, for his midlife crisis in 2019, and he decided to get serious about producing his own series, Fungus and Mold, in his spare time. The pilot episode won several awards at film festivals. He now hopes to take his hobby to the next level and make creating original animated content his main state home, main state someday. So now I will leave you, Kilian, in his presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. Now oh, there we go. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, I'll just give you a very quick agenda here. What I'm planning to talk about. Um, <clears throat> so I created this series called Fungus on Mold all by myself, and it's not a complete series yet. Uh, there are only two episodes because this stuff takes time. Uh, I will initially talk shortly of, uh, about my overall workflow. Uh, then you'll have about six minutes. I'll show you some scenes and some tricks I use to make these scenes happen in Moho. Uh, the biggest chunk will be going through my character rigs and uh, what challenges I had making them and how I how I. Uh, figured out things to, to make things work in those rigs and then we will have roughly 15 minutes of q and at the end so let's dive right in um, um, i start when i make a new episode i start writing a script and for that script i use the standard industry formatting for screenplays which looks something like this not very sexy uh, but there is a good reason that this ancient format is still used because with this font size and this kind of formatting, you get roughly one minute of film per page. So you just have to look at the page count and you have a good idea how long your script will actually be when you put it on the screen. Uh, to make this script, I use, uh, I use a format called Fountain, which is basically plain text. And some apps can use that uh, format to make it look neat. Uh, like it should be. So I write my whole script in this in this uh, app. Um, and for every scene, you have a scene header, which roughly tells you is it internal, external, what day of, of uh, what time of day is it. And once I'm done with the whole script, I automatically number. Um, 
I'm using this C numbering here to number all the scenes. And basically these scene numbers and the scene names are the basis for my whole filing system when I create the series. Um, for example, if you look at all the data that I have here, all the scenes, this is for, uh, I think episode two, yes. So my scene, my, number, so <clears throat> my naming scheme is, first I have this, this thing, which means see, um, season one, episode two, and I know it's, it's uh, scene number 13C, and then the scene header. So for one thing, if I look at, oh, there is the scene with a vortex hanger, and there is another one here, I have a rough idea of what scene this actually is without having to refer to the script. But if I want to refer to the script, I know, I know exactly where to look. Um, it's very simple and works very well. Even if this one folder goes lost and I put it on the desktop mistakenly, I will know where it belongs. Um, uh, after my script is completed, um, I normally break down the script uh, by scene uh, into tasks, what I have to do. And I use, I love Kanban. So I have this Kanban software here, which is a way of organizing tasks in a visual way and the status they're in in a visual way. And I make a long, long list for every scene. Uh, this is for the artwork, so mostly backgrounds. Uh, I make a one to do for every background I have to make. Sometimes there are also like, like here's a ship I have to design and here's a character I have to make artwork, rough sketches or final sketches for. Then I make separate tasks for Moho rigging. That could be just a, an update, like here mold with ripped clothes. It's, I have to update him so he has ripped clothes. Or sometimes I have to, create an entirely new character, uh, a rig for that, and that's another task. And then I make tasks for, for animating the whole scene, uh, for every scene, which are still all in the blocked column here, because as, lo as long as I don't have the artwork and the rigs, I cannot start working on those. It also helps me to get a feeling of, of progress because making an episode takes very long. It's all done in my spare time. And uh, you, it's very daunting. Um, sometimes you feel like you're, you're working on this every day and you, you just don't get done and nothing gets done. But if you have these kind of to-do lists where you can see, oh, I already finished 20 of 150 to-dos or something, at least you have a feeling of progress and it keeps the spirits up. But it's really important as well. Uh, once I have broken down uh, all these to-do tasks, I would record narration, which I'm doing with uh, GarageBand. Um, which comes free with every Mac. Uh, I basically would record every voice, every character in a separate track because they all have different effects attached to them. And once I'm done with the whole narration and the timing is more or less feels okay, I would export every single track of these as a separate audio file. Um, I've lately switched to use Logic Audio because uh, it can open the old GarageBand files and I can just do this in one go. And in GarageBand, I have to, for every track, I have to do a separate export. It's a bit tedious. Um, now, um, we're not ready to go into Moho yet. Uh, I have to, of course, create all the background art, uh, which I do in Affinity. And the reason I don't use, <clears throat> I don't draw my backgrounds directly in Moho, there's several reasons for that. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, um, Moho, the, exp the vector export, especially for SVG, um, is a bit strange. So um, sometimes when I have backgrounds with very much varying line widths, it tends to chop up those lines and stuff into separate shapes. And it's, it isn't, isn't that reusable. So um, that's one reason. And the other thing is if I use bitmaps, um, in my case, PNGs with transparency externally, it's much easier to, if, if I wanna fix something, to just replace the external file uh, instead of having to open the Moho files and fixing it in every single file. Um, <clears throat> and I, from, from Affinity, I export, like this, I decide which parts have to be separate parts placed in, in 3D space. So um, I have tons of layers here to make sure I can always edit every single aspect and tweak it if I, if I don't like it. And when I export, I, I can in Affinity decide what I export. Like say this whole thing is one graphic that I export and this one is one graphic that I export. And Affinity also lets me uh, export several versions of one graphic in different resolutions and sizes. So that streamlines the, uh, the whole effort quite a bit. And, uh, if I do it in Affinity, I can basically reuse all my assets if I want to make posters or banners or 
or, or graphics for my website, I can all export it from here. So this is really uh, useful to, to have it in this app and, and, and have all these different export formats at hand. Um, <clears throat> uh, once all the backgrounds are done, I would go into Final Cut Pro and I would uh, import my audio, all the audio tracks, every voice is a separate track. Uh, and times to that narration, I would put in background screens that I created. And for more complex scenes, I would put in static characters just to figure out <clears throat> where do they stand for continuity. So I can make sure in every scene, they don't suddenly switch positions. And um, that's why it's kind of like an animatic that I'm creating, but since everything is not really moving, it's more like an anesthetic. Uh, and, uh, but I have stuff in here, like, like our view over the back of Gluck. So there is a little bit of animation to it to remind myself, like all oh, the camera has to zoom out here, do something. And then I would also tweak the timing overall. So I have narrated this whole thing, imagining how long it would take for certain actions to happen. But when you put it on screen, you often notice, okay, it's not gonna work. Or maybe after this dialogue, I want to have a dramatic pause. And then you keep on tweaking the timing. And once I have the whole episode laid out here and I'm happy with the timing and it feels all right, I would then go to every scene and export the, the whole audio for that scene uh, as an MP3 file. And then I'm finally ready to go to Moho um, and start putting the scenes together. For example, the engine room we had uh, before, um, this is a scene I put together. And if you look at it, you can see how it's placed in 3D. So I have the background here. I have some elements at the front to get proper parallax. I added the this vortex here as a particle um, emitter in Moho itself. And the characters are placed here too, as you can see in the 3D space. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, I would also import this this audio, which complete which contains all narration, the whole dialogue. And then the next thing I would do, what I should do, what I'd animate, um, and that might surprise professional animators. The first thing I animate is actually the mouth, and that's a very simple reason. Um, the audio is fixed anyway. So I have to animate the mouth according to the audio. So that is kind of locked in here. Uh, and so I do that first to get it out of the way. Uh, the other reason is I think uh, mouth shapes are an important part um, of the facial expression of the characters. So if I'm going to animate the, you know, the, the eyebrows and all the facial expressions and the gestures, I want to see those mouths in their final shape just to get a good idea of what it's going to look like and whether the facial expression is correct or not. <clears throat> um, and uh, then I, as I said, as after, after I animate all the mouths, uh, I, which by the way, I still do manually. And there's another, there's a reason I do that. Um, I've tried Papagayo and other software uh, that automates that a little bit. Um, and I never found it to be fully satisfying because it just assumes if you have to say these words, it has these amounts of sounds or vowels or, 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 or phonemes. And it kind of assumes that in every case, your mouth would form the shape for every sound in your sentence, regardless of speed. And I think that's just a wrong assumption because very often if you say something very quickly, you will slur words, you will slur your mouth movement. And although you say three sounds, your mouth might just make one opening. Uh, and there's just so many, so much movement you can put into two or three frames of animation. So what I do here basically is I go through the audio and as you can see here, uh, because I'm using for the mouse, I'm using the, um, interpolate sub layers to get a very smooth mouse movement. Uh, I, the fastest switch I would do is, is um, one mouth switch per two frames. So I animate on the twos, that's the fastest or less. So that at least if I change mouth shapes, I have one interim frame as a transition to the other mouse shapes to get some feeling of motion rather than just flipping the mouse shapes as a switch back and forth. Uh, so I just go there step by step through the audio and make sure um, the, the mouth shapes are correct. I would do this using the um, switch selection here. 
And so I go step and I hear the sounds when I step forward <clears throat> and then just switch the, the mouse as needed in here. For me, that works well. And I've gotten so used to it that I'm pretty quick at it. And I find you get superior results, although it's a bit more work doing it this way and much more control. Um, so that's how I do the mouse. Um, um, one second here. Okay, now let's look into a bunch of scenes I put together and some of the tricks I'm using. Um, okay, so one thing Moho is really doing a great job at is when you have characters and you, you resize them or you put you move them in the Z axis they become smaller, it does all the scaling for you for like for the lines and everything. So it's it it never it always looks natural. But since I am using um, bitmap backgrounds and those backgrounds have fixed lines and sometimes they might be a bit thicker than Moho would make it if you were to scale it in Moho, there is there might be a bit of a mismatch or sometimes you just feel like ah that character could have a bit thicker lines. It looks a bit too thin, a bit too weak. And in the past, that was a, that was really hard to fix, or, or almost impossible to fix. But now, at the end of episode two, I basically re-rigged all my characters um, to that's not the one um, <clears throat> to have a different setup. So if I go into this character, go into his head, head base, select the head here. Um, <clears throat> you can see that this this head, the base, that's a circle has two styles applied. One is the color for the style, which in, uh, includes the blue um, fill and this shade here, this, this darkish kind of shade and no outlines. And the second style is the outline and no fill. And every single shape has a second style, has the same all outline style, which is just the outline with no fill. And what this allows me to do is I can just go here in the styles and you can see <clears throat> all the styles for Alice. That's the name of that blue robot. And on top of it, there's the all outline style. So if I select this, I can now just adjust this style. And immediately I can change all the line widths for the character just with one go. So this allows me in the rare case, I really have to adjust line widths, make them thicker or thinner. I can jump into every character for this scene and fix the line widths in one go. Really useful trick. It's not used often, but a real lifesaver when you need it. Another thing I did is with camera angles. Um, most of the time, you don't have to worry much about it. I love the camera in Moho. You can move it around. It gives you a lot of freedom and a lot of you can do a lot of spontaneous decisions <clears throat> about framing. Um, there is a scene yeah where he points towards this pillar at the back and i want the camera to to show the pillar and <clears throat> to make this happen i i move the camera backwards and tilt it up but if i would only do this with the camera what happens is that of course all the characters have no depth there's zero depth so if you tilt the camera you get foreshortening and the characters would literally look like cardboard images and it would look really bad. So what I've done here is to create the illusion that this stuff is all still standing straight. <clears throat> it's here, you can see already what's going on. Um, I, had, I had them face the camera at all times. So if the camera, this is the camera here, when the camera moves back and tilts upwards, you can see the characters tilt with the camera. So they would not distort in perspective and uh, this is super easy to do. Uh, you just take the, ca the character you want to face the camera. In the layer settings here, there's this face camera option and you tell it to face image plane ax axis. Um, I've used this in a few places where I wanted to tilt the camera up or down and didn't want to, uh, you know, um, didn't want the characters to look like, like uh, cardboard cutouts. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a bit in my throat. <clears throat> I love dolly shots because they give the the really you know you can use the two point five D camera and 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 create the impression of depth. Um, in the cockpit, there's a dolly shot. I go back to the other character here, 
um, it's really nice. Uh, and this shot works, although I've really um, done this with minimal effort, so to speak, because if you look at the thing, the whole background is just one flat image. Um, so I just draw the drew the background in perspective and made it one flat image. I didn't want to bother to make the, the floor as a floor in 3D and put it all there. And in this case, this works because the only movement the camera is doing is, is this Z axis. It's a vertical movement to the background. So it looks fine. But if I were to move the camera, say, um, um, maybe go back here, horizontally with parallax, you would see this is really weird because then suddenly the floor and the hairs of the carpet of that <clears throat> wouldn't move, but the the desks would look like they're sliding on the floor. So you, you cannot always cheat yourself um, out of doing the whole thing. It really depends on the animation you're doing. And in the future, I might create recreate the cockpit with a proper floor on the bottom and walls on the sides. But for many shots, it's enough if you just have the whole background as just one flat image, if you don't do too much fancy camera movement. It can also work if you just cut the camera from one position to the other because you don't see the, sli the sliding. Um, <clears throat> uh, the camera in Moho allows me to do a lot of ad hoc. So I don't, you might have noticed in my workflow that where is the storyboard, you might wonder. Where where do I decide the framing for each scene and where I do, do I decide about the, the every single shot for each scene? And uh, actually, I don't really. When I make a scene, I have an idea where the camera, where, where the characters are positioned in the scene. Uh, what the location is, of course, because I create that as a background uh, with all the items to place in 3D. And then I kind of start animating. And once the whole scene is done and finished animating, I kind of at that final point decide how the camera is supposed to move to put it in scene properly. Uh, because Moho allows me to do that. I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to redo anything if I, if, if I decide that the camera move, moves somewhere else. Uh, there's, for example, this scene here where you first have this this panning, and the waiting, and then there is this conversation going between the two, and um, you get a very slow dolly shot. Then zooming in on him, and then the next thing is a wide shot where the two start talking about geek gobbledygook, and Mold completely can't follow their conversation. And then the camera zooms in on him because he's kind of lost, makes a snarky remark, and the camera then cuts back to the two saying, hey, I heard that. And this is all ad hoc. So when I, when I scripted the scene, I just had the conversation. I had no, no, only a very blurry idea of how I would put this into scene. And I would then decide on the camera wound at the very end of the animation. This might not work for others, and this might only work because I'm a one-man operation, so I can be <clears throat> so spontaneous. Um, because I can imagine if you ask an animator to animate the scene, you have to give them direction and say, I want this camera shot, and I want to have this angle. Otherwise, just do whatever you want might not always work. But for a one-man operation, I think uh, it really works, and Moho really gives me the power to, um, to just to be spontaneous and, and do stuff ad hoc quickly. Um, here's a scene which is kind of complex with uh, lots of overlaps. And until I figured out how to do this, I, I always thought it's it's almost impossible to do this. It's a very short sequence. So just to briefly make this looping here, you can see there's a lot of overlapping going on. And uh, doing this in Moho is actually insanely simple. Uh, let me just remove the characters in front because they're kind of not needed here. So you can see what's happening here is this robot who is at behind the fish character has his arms going over the body of that character, but below, if you look here, below the head. And it's super easy to do this. You first would put the two characters in scene here, the robot behind the fish in, at the front. You would do a, a simple, you know, a rough animation doesn't have to be perfect just to get the overall movement. And once you're happy and think, yeah, that movement works, then you start thinking, okay, what has to be in front of what? And first of all, you want to put the arms in front of this guy. So you would go and make a reference object, which is here, the re reference layer <clears throat> from of, of this, this guy at the back. 
which would create something like a copy on alias that moves exactly the same way as the original object. So in this case, I put this guy at the front and uh, then you would just switch off or make invisible all the layers you don't need in front. So here, the only thing I need in front is this arm, the shoulder and the other arm. Uh, and so I have this layering done here. And as you can see here, it's not perfect yet because the head still needs to be in front of all of this. So again, you go to the, to the guy, the fish guy, create a reference or a reference layer of him and again make everything invisible that that doesn't need to be uh, in front and in this case it's really only the head which has to be visible and the rest is all switched off as you can see and now you have the whole thing layered perfectly you know um totally just took you took your minutes and and since these are reference layers you can still tweak if you go to the to the base layers here you can still tweak um the animation and it stays layered and and the top layer will move with it no problem so it can be very you can do a lot of try and error and you don't lose any work or have to redo anything if you want to retweak the animation <clears throat> here is one more scene um, of mold running and the background kind of zooming back it's a very short sequence and I want to. I'm showing this because I want to show you how you can do with minimal effort get get maximum <laughs> results. Because what actually happens in this scene is a big fake show. Um, I'm just wiggling the character up and down, and I'm wiggling the background up up and down a bit. And I don't even zoom the background in the z axis, so in the depth. I'm just I'm just resizing it a bit. And this is um. I think this shows the the general rule for video production is if it looks good it's good it doesn't have to be perfect it doesn't have to even work it can fall apart after you say cut you know um as long as on screen it looks good it's good and this is also a good segue into my character rigs um because i want to with this i want to show you that that do not obsess over making things right i know that there are a lot of people who who obsess over making the perfect rig, you know? Um, they, they take days to create a rig that does any thinkable position and rotation, and they make rigs that are 360 degree head turns and body turns, and it might be a great exercise for, for rigging, you know? And if you can do that, more power to you. But I think that the effort and the time spent to create that supposedly perfect rig is in no relation to what you actually get out of that rig. And eventually there will come a point when, when you want to do something with a character that you didn't think of, and then you have to adjust the rig anyway. And so what I do with my rigs is, first of all, for almost all characters that I use more frequently, I have a front and a back rig. So that tells you that I never do 360 degree bad body turns or head turns. Um, if I really have to turn the character around a 360 degree or just from back to front, what I would do is I would initiate the, the, the turn uh, and then basically flip to the back rig of that character. So place the back rig exactly in the same position as the front one and just flip over. And in most cases, uh, nobody will ever notice. And there are so many other ways of, of creating that illusion. So if you use squash and stretch to emphasize that motion and then flip, uh, or if you cut away from the character, so like the character starts turning around, you cut away from him to another guy, and when you cut back, he's turned around already. Uh, you can sell that motion in so many ways that you don't have to have the perfect bit that shows every single detail of that turnaround. Because most of the time, uh, a head turn, a body turn takes, I don't know, from two to four frames. And I mean, how much animation you're going to show in four frames? Um, so let me show the simplest rig I have is Alice, it's this, this robot, and it's simple because he doesn't have a, a mouth that moves, only this hole at the bottom. He has one red eye, doesn't blink or do anything much either. Um, <clears throat> he has a head turn, um, a smart action here, so to, to move arms above and below the base, and you can look left and right. I have a he scale head, bone because when he talks to create the illusion of him talking I, I wiggle this a bit so he, you feel at least like okay this guy is talking so it doesn't feel too static when he talks without a moving mouth um, I usually always use target bones for the hands of my characters and uh, 
that's because um, by default, because I think when people, well, when they hold some, something anyway, but when people talk and being expressive, they tend to move their hands um, independently from the body. So, um, so when, when he talks, it feels more natural when the hands have their own life and their own way of moving rather than just being attached in a stiff way to the body and moving with the whole body. And if I really need to uh, um, have this kind of circular, um, Per perpendicular motion for a, for a walk cycle, for example. In walk cycles, it would be nonsense to use target bones because it's so hard to move them in a natural swinging way. Then I have a targeting toggle here where I can switch off the targeting and then I can just move the arms uh, in, a, in a natural um, way in this, in this arch for, for walk cycles. Uh, this guy also has the scissors I can open and close and then change the the wrists here, the feet are always using targeting bones, so they always stay on the floor at all times. Also targeting bones for hands gives you, of course, the option to do funny squash and stretch with the character, so you can be a bit more expressive. And uh, same for the legs here, so I can always have this uh, natural movement here. And then I have a down up movement, which I struggled with. I first tried to make the, the head turning up and down using this, um, pivoting motion so because this is a line uh, it should actually pivot around this uh, um, this axis here and i never got it to work properly with the left right motion and the up down motion combined so i in the in the end gave up i thought man this is a cartoon it doesn't have to be naturalistic or super 3d so i just have this flat um, top down motion with a little bit of squashing going on and funny enough it works for all the scenes where he looks up, it looks okay. It doesn't bother me. And I think, yeah, if, if, if it looks fine, it's fine. It doesn't have to be correct in 3D all the time. This is a cartoon after all. So this is uh, Alice. Um, <clears throat> um, I want to show you the fungus rig here. Um, this character is called Fungus. He's an alien with stalked eyes. He's got a bit more stuff going on here. He also has these um, target bones for his hands by default, but you can switch them off here too. There is the targeting toggle again that you can switch off. Oh, I've got to put frame one for that. There we go. Okay, so, so he's got the targeting bones. You can switch that off. Uh, he has a body turn. Again, that puts the arms on top, on top and below the body. He has a head turn going on here. Um, he has a head deform, and since he is kind of like a like a snail or a slug, uh, his head deform is for expression. And when you head turn, you want to squish it a bit to give it a bit more, uh, make it a bit more organic. He can go all the way down because he's kind of a slug. And this is one of the fantastic, fantastic things about Moho that you, because you can layer these smart actions, the head turn still works even in this super squished format so it's kind of amazing how how these things never rarely really break your rigs if you do them properly um <clears throat> i'd also like to show you the eye rig because it's a bit it's something i worked on for a while and i got this from a from a um, um tutorial um this eye rig here they have a central pin bone that controls the eyes in a very proportional fashion so i can move it from edge to edge in any direction it proportionally with his eye rig. And the reason I set this up is, oh, let me first explain how this works. So this bone here, I can actually select it. Yep. Um, <clears throat> no, that's the wrong one. Um, this bone here um, controls the vertical movement of the eyes. So if I go into the smart action, you can see it goes from center down. I have another one, smart action goes from center up, same horizontal. Center left, center right. You know, I guess most of you know how this works. Um, <clears throat> and then what I do is I tell to I tell this bone to use the pin bone here as a target. Same for the upper one here. There's a, this bone uses the this pin bone as a target, so it'll it will it'll kind of try to aim at the pin bone at all times. And then I tell the pin bone to use the central controller bone, if you look at this here, oops, it's a different tool. Um, this pin bone is set to use the, 
uh, position control bone called eyes, which is the central controller bone. And so the central bone here controls the position of this bone, but only on the Y axis. So zero means zero X and Y means one, one to one control on the Y axis. So it will move exactly the same way on the Y axis as for this bone and vice versa for this one. So here I say it'll only follow the X axis of the controller bone, but not the Y axis. And again, if you look at, what happens here? So, so those bones follow the x and y axis, and the these these two vertical horizontal control bones always aim at these two bones here. And the reason I set this up this way is uh, in a previous rig, I actually used had these bones directly aim at this bone. So the target bone would be the controller bone, and you can see already if the upper bone would aim would have a target bone here it would be a different angle. It would be not such a steep angle. And same for the uh, top left position, it would, uh, it would aim here instead of more up there. And then you would have a really hard time getting this pupil go all the way to the edge of the eye. And the whole movement wouldn't be proportional. It would, it would, be, it would feel weirdly distorted. So this bone really is the bee's knees for, for, for proportional movement of these kind of widgets. Um, all my characters um, have uh, are symmetrical. That's why I was talking about flipping characters. Uh, I have limited resources, and so all my characters are created uh, mostly symmetrical, so I can just flip them from left to right. And that's the reason why, if, if you might have noticed, I call my layers not left right, but I say FB stands for front and back. Uh, the simple reason is that because I flip my characters a lot. Um, left and right has no meaning, but when I flip my character, the, the top, the front arm will always be the front arm, whether it goes left or right, doesn't matter, unless I do a body turn. But body turns usually uh, are, are not permanent, uh, permanent positions. So they are usually a transition to, to flipping the character, for example. Um, <clears throat> and talking about body turns, um, I used to do body turns using layer, uh, layer, what's it called? Um, layer depth, I mean, no, it's called uh, depth sort, yeah. Animated layer order, uh, I used to do that. And you can make it work, you know, you can have a body turn and then you just move, if, if you want to, the shoulder and the arm go behind the body, you just move it down there. Works fair enough, but what, what happens is, um, if you do that in a, in a smart bone, um, it will lock the layer order. So for example, if, if I tell this guy, okay, I want him to do a body turn and move the arms like this, and I want to have this arm, I want to have the lower arm and the hand stay on top of his belly. I couldn't fix that if I would use layer animated layer order because the layer order is locked and I cannot move the, 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 these layers on top of the, of the belly, complete lockout impossible. So what I what I now did, I, I completely rigged all my characters to do the same. Um, if I go back into the um, smartphone here, body turn two, just watch these layers here at the, oops, sorry. Watch the layers here and what happens when I do the body turn, you see they become grayed out and highlighted. So I create my characters in a way that all the limbs that have to go above or below the torso, I first create them below the torso. This would be here, the arm, shoulder, arm, hand, arm, they're all below the torso. And then I create reference layers of all these layers that have to go above and below the body. And I will place them on top of the torso. So these are all the reference layers on top. And all I do now with the body turn is that I there is always there's the same one layer above and always one below. I just switch the visibility off and on for these layers to create the illusion of movement uh, in the Z axis. And <clears throat> because this allows me, so if you do this, your, your layer ordering will never be locked. And then you can manually adjust layer ordering in the timeline if you have to. Um, for example, with this guy here, what I can do now is um, I can go here, here, I think, yep. 
uh, I can take his hand and his lower arm and move it up here and boom, the arm goes on top of the of the belly. So you can do ad hoc tweaks to your to your rig if you want to do a bit more complicated movements. Say, for example, um, if you want to say, oh no, I actually want to have his 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 upper hand to be even on top of the other hand, no problem. Then you would just take this hand and just go just below the other hand. And here you go. Very complex layering done ad hoc, didn't take you a minute. Um, so I think that 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 uh, reference layer switching is really helpful to keep your 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 rigs flexible for any kind of tweaks you might want to want to make, and it happens a lot, especially with arms. For example, if I do a head turn with most characters, I just use layer order animation because it'll never happen that you turn your head and your ear stays on top. But with arms which are freely movable, you you want to have this quite a bit. Um, Uh, all my characters, almost all my characters, have two mouths, uh, which which are switch layers. And I create. Um, this is basically again efficiency. Um, I have a standard mouth that is standard or smiling, which is just normal neutral, which is the one you're looking at right now. So and with all the mouth shapes that you have for for speaking and all the vowels. And then I have also, if I make this invisible and I switch to the angry mouth, it's the angry or shocked or scared mouth or panic mouth, where I also have different levels of, of, of shouting. Um, so mouth openings without particular sounds assigned to them. Um, the way I create these mouths is that I start with a default position, which is either in my case A, or sometimes the etcetera position, which is the, the shape that you use for the things like S, T, K sounds. Uh, but I would create these layers um, already containing all the elements I need for every mouth shape. That means teeth, when in his case, there's only, only one row of teeth. There is a tongue, it's invisible, it's at the back, but it's there. And the mouth has the lip and everything you need. And <clears throat> I do this so I can then just copy the layer and uh, move points to to make a different mouth shape to make sure that all the switch layers have the same number of sub layers, the same number of shapes in them, and the same number of points. Because if if that is if if you do that, you can in in the switch tab here you can check interpolate sub layers, and you will get absolutely smooth animation between the mouth shapes, and that really helps to to make your, your animation look much more professional than just mouse flipping back and forth from one position to the other. Um, ah, the eye rig. I have, yeah, what I also do a lot is I have a blink bone because your character has to blink a lot and it's usually a, a complex motion with uh, lower eyelids, upper eyelids, um, uh, and, and the eyes themselves squishing a bit. So the, the blink motion uses all these bones. To, to, to work. Um, I also have a have an eyes, let me just fix this. Uh, the eyes of one bohm here also does surprise, so with smaller pupils. And uh, for the lids, I have a bone that could that, that does like sad or angry. Oops, angry for the for the expression, which I can animate that too. Let's take a look at Mold's rig. Right? Mold is a bit different because his eyes don't have lids. Um, well, maybe they have this sunglass looking, they're actually bionic implants, uh, don't allow for much ex expressive eyes. So I have to do a bit more with the eyebrows. So his rig is a bit different. He has a height adjuster for the eyebrows and a brow pitch adjuster. Uh, and I have the angry worried uh, switch here so I can give him this, this skeptic look very easily, very quickly. Um, I have a head turn. And as I said, this is done doing um, layer order animation because all the parts on the head are fixed, are gonna move up and down by themselves. The head turn is done. So the base head shape and the nose are done doing point animations. For the rest, I usually use um, um, layer. I just animate the layer. So I squish the whole layer and move it left and right. Um, 
that's easier for me. Uh, I'll do a little bit of head scaling here, squash and stretch for expressiveness. I also have a head tilt here, which can also be used uh, quite well if, for example, you have a camera angle that take that shoot that looks up the, the character more from the top, and you don't really want to make a new rig just for this uh, top view. Uh, if you use the head tilt, you can sometimes sell this as a um, view from above works. Um, and the body tone is a bit more involved because mold has these shoulder patches here, which has to have to be on top of the body at all times, but the arms have to move um, behind the torso and in front of it, depending on the body tone. Uh, he also has a separate shape for the <clears throat> left and right part of the jacket. Um, so he can grab into the jacket, jacket and pull his gun out. I can show you the animation later. Another thing he has, which is kind of new, um, which I've just started doing in episode two, switch off the targeting toggle here. If you look at his arms, there is an extra bone on his elbow. And this is for, um, this is actually for foreshortening in the third dimension. So you have this fake 3D, so the arms sticking towards the camera or going away from it. And I made this because I found I had a really hard time making a good front walk cycle animation. <clears throat> And uh, there's a walk cycle animation here. And with this new bone, I can sell this much, much easier. So I have this walk cycle here and it looks much more natural than anything I tried before. And I'll probably use this same mechanism in most of my human characters uh, from now on. Um, his feet have uh, an extra switch to, to kind of turn the foot around in different directions. Uh, this again, because his feet and his whole lower body is just a black shape, you can fake a lot of stuff here really well because most of the hard work is done by your brain. So if I, for example, move the leg up and make it a bit shorter here and, um, and I move it up here, maybe give it a bit of a shorter look here. You already think um, he's sticking his leg towards the Z axis, whereas it's just a black shape. Your brain just creates the illusion of this being into the third dimension. So this is a, a really quick and easy cop out if you don't want to do too complex 3D stuff, but it still have this third, this Z axis illusion going on. If you have flat shapes, no outlines, your brain does all the, all the, all the heavy lifting to create that illusion actually. <clears throat> and, uh, then there is the last rig I want to go to. Glock is the newest rig I have, this character, this fish-like character. It's a bit more complex because I based this character on a tutorial, which I really want to mention here, uh, from Bloop Animation. <laughs> they have a great Moho tutorial. Uh, and this is made by a professional animator. And it, it's, it's, it's really impressive. You get, you, you, he teaches you how to do this, this kind of animation, this level of professional animation really fantastic he shows uh, everything from rigging to to um, point animation head turns blocking a scene you name it and i uh, so I, I i did the tutorial and created this guy right afterwards and i'm using the the, the oops. i'm using the eye rig that i showed you before uh, he has a bit more eye stuff going on because he has got his eyebrows and angle for the eyebrows and he has upper and lower eyelids and he's got a blink animation here. <coughs> and I used this, this eye rig for the head turn as well. So I made a, a horizontal head turn, left, right, and all with point animation. So this looks a bit more 3D-ish, a bit more in, uh, involved. I made a vertical um, uh, head tilt and then combined the two with this head rig to be absolutely fluid motion. It's quite amazing to see how your own character come to life like this. Um, so this is a really great widget. It's not perfect because my, my head animation isn't, isn't fully symmetrical. So if I go to extreme positions like bottom right, you can see it, it kind of breaks there. You can see that the, the, the hard hat kind of warps in a weird form, but it's no big deal because this guy too is symmetrical. So if I want him to look to the bottom right, what I would do is his body turn also has only 90 degree angle, if you can see that side front 90 degree if i need anything beyond that i just flip the body 
uh, and then reverse the motion. So I would, if I want him to look to the bottom right, I would basically just initiate the animation to here, flip the body, move it back, which then is the other direction. And then I would um, just have him look to the bottom left, which is a flip the character, of course, is the bottom right. And here it works. Uh, so flipping characters and flipping heads is is, is a, a big time saver, and you don't need to um, completely rig out every single possible movement you might want to make. Uh, here's some extras. He has a hard hat, so I actually added a a, 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 um, a bone here to animate um, this hat jumping if he does quick uh, sudden motions or if he's surprised. You can have this funny little animation here going. And there is another special bone for him because he is a fish. So when he is under distress or in danger, he has his ability to um, blow up like a blow fish, a puffer fish. So you can do this here. And again, that's the magic of, of, of smart actions. The head turn is still mostly intact despite all the distortion going on. Even the arms here, I can, I can move, you know, and it just works fine. Uh, and it's kind of amazing how this, how you can still have all of this work, even with extreme distortion like this. Um, I think I'm a bit running a bit late, but I think I'm mostly through with uh, what I want to show, how I produce my uh, characters. And I think we can go to Q and A now. Thank you so much, Killian. Uh, this has been a, an excellent explanation of your working process. And there are uh, a lot of questions and uh, some messages from the participants, like Bless, uh, who said, uh, I watched episode one. It's funny. I'm planning on watching the rest of this, this week. Um, another message uh, from Magno, perfect rig. Also, um, another message from Magno, also awesome cartoon design in Moho. Uh, so, well, let's get uh, to questions. Uh, one of the main general questions are, what are your inspiration references for making this show possible? Yeah, so my biggest inspiration, I really have to pay kudos, is actually <clears throat> um, Olin Rogers. You might have never heard of this guy. So Olin Rogers is a YouTuber and, and he does short sketches and crazy little stories. <clears throat> and he has been doing this for a long time. And then he had the idea of making an animation. And he did it first himself and it was so horrible and bad that like, basically it was ignored by, by, by the entire world. And then at some point he decided to actually pay some serious money, have a professional studio make his make kind of a proof of concept 10 minute uh, kind of long trailer. And uh, he called that final space. You might've heard of that. And somebody, <laughs> somebody saw it on YouTube, basically some exec or something at, at, at Netflix saw it on YouTube. And eventually he got a deal to do final space. And if you don't know it, I can really recommend this series. You can watch it on Netflix. And I think it's, it's now elsewhere as well. Uh, um, so he did. I think he drew. He didn't draw all the characters. He's but he just he does the narration of some of the characters and he writes the story. But this thing that it still happens that some YouTuber gets discovered and gets to make a, a, an animation that that goes world goes global through Netflix. Mm -hmm. For me, it was like wow. I really man, it's possible. And and that's when I gave me the gave me the the, the confidence to say man, it just let's, let's just do this. So that was a big inspiration. Um, <clears throat> I also like Rick and Morty um, um, because actually the animation they do in Rick and Morty now it's much more complex. But if you look at the first season, um, mm -hmm. it's it's not that it's not that super sophisticated, uh, but it, it's good enough. I mean, if you want to tell a story, unless you want to do really artistic stuff where you have to be a great designer and everything, something like Samurai Jack, you know, I couldn't do that because I, I'm just probably not enough of an artist. But I want to tell entertaining stories so i don't think my rigs have to be super disney level amazing <clears throat> and so I, I i orient towards these um series like family guy which are not super great animated but they're fun to watch and you can binge watch them and the, for me that's the inspiration i get most of the time 
Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there are still uh, a few more uh, greetings. For example, Adesina is saying, I'm glad to be here. This is great. Look, uh, thanks, great presentation. Uh, a question regarding uh, trying to pitch the series. For example, Christopher says, uh, have mm -hmm. you pitched your series to any TV network or streaming services? Um, yes and no. So what I've done, if you, if you read my blog, actually, <clears throat> um, I I have tried to 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 contact some. You don't if you, if you don't know somebody, if if you don't have a sales representative, you usually don't get your foot in the door, unless you're Olin Rogers and happen and happen to have your stuff on YouTube, have enough followers, and maybe someone sees it. But most of the time. Um, you don't get your foot in the door. So you need either a sales representative or you need a distributor who can get your foot in the door. Uh, that's why I attended AFM. So there are basically three film markets uh, every year where all the movies are sold, by for all the independent movies are sold. One is the AFM, the American film market. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one is Cannes. So with the Cannes Festival, there's also the... Uh, the, the 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 film market that runs and then there's the Berlinale which is the European the EFM European film market and I went to the AFM I attended I learned a lot I got to exchange myself a lot with other filmmakers but I found <clears throat> that series are a hard sell unless they're done <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, because it takes so much time to make a series you can't really sell the series unless you have it finished. Right. If you have it and it, it's a it's a it's a it's a product, then people might be interested. So, what I was always asked by everybody at AFM, and I think that's what everybody is focusing on, is do you have a feature film? Which means do you have a full one hour or upwards of one hour animated film? Uh, because the turnover for these is, is is shorter, and it's easier to sell those also as downloads and single things. Where a series you end up streaming, and streaming doesn't make much money unless you can do merchandise along with it and all the other stuff that comes around. Uh, and so I think if you want to, if you really you're about commercial success and want to get this into into cinemas, the best bet is to make a fee full feature film rather than a series. But I like the long format of series and and the depth you can go into. So I just keep on turning off my episodes until hopefully somebody picks me up and I keep pitching my stuff. I have a pitch deck actually. I have outlines for for a bit more than the first season that I want mm -hmm. to uh, want to write about. So if anybody, if I ever find people, and I, I did this at the AFM, I pitched it to tons of people, but everybody was like, yeah, we don't really do, sci we don't really do animation, or they say we don't do series or whatnot. <clears throat> um, and because this is kind of, uh, I aim this at, at teenagers and adults, which makes it adult animation, although I'm, I'm, it's not that super graphic or I'm not using sexual innuendo, like like Brick and Morty has a lot of these topics. I, I, I'm not really into that, but it's still adult animation. And people say it's, it's a hard sell because the only game in town is basically Adult Swim. They do almost 99% of all adult animation that that, that, that uh, on the market. And Netflix is doing it now themselves as well a bit. But um, yeah, it's a hard sell. Um, so my recommendation, if you want to do animation, you want to sell, do feature films, make it for kids or families. It's much easier to sell that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> and questions about um, uh, timings and the process itself. There are a lot of people is asking, how long does it take you to make a rig? How long does it take you to make an episode? Um, I can't really give you reliable numbers because I have a I have a day job and two kids. Oops, what is doing? Um, I have a day job and two kids, and what what little is left on free time, I I I, I work on my animation most of the time. Um, so it's it, I have a really unreliable schedule, and uh, so for an episode, my first episode that I did, I had to start learning how do you write a, a screenplay script and how do you even animate and how do you, how do I put everything together? I had no idea. I had to figure it out myself, you know? And so that took me forever. So my first episode took me roughly 20 months to put together in my spare time again. I mean, I have a full-time job that I work on. Uh, and the second episode took me about eight months, although it's much longer than the first episode. And I think if I would do this full-time, I could probably produce one episode in, a month or two, probably. I don't know. 
Um, it really depends also, the thing is, the more episodes you produce, the more reusable assets you have. So for the third episode, I have to do just a bunch of backgrounds, most of the characters I have already, and that they work, I don't have to do much extra for them. So it, it probably gets easier over time because you can just start reusing assets. Uh, rigging depends on the character. If I have a character that I'm going to be using steadily in more than one episode, I want to have a full rig that does everything. That can take me up to several days sometimes to, if I have to figure out something really complex, complex head turn, if the character is complex. If it's a simple character, I get it rigged in maybe a, a full day or so. So I know that pros do that in like four hours or something. I, I, I still have no idea how they do that. Uh, and very often I just use uh, throwaway characters for just one scene. So I, I just have a drawing and I put two or three bones and wiggle them a bit so it looks like it's moving. But that that's a matter of minutes or maybe hours maximum. So it really depends on what you want to do with the with the character. Mm -hmm. And another question is, how has Moho helped you in your creative process? So I said the camera itself is is a great help because I don't have to do storyboards that much because I can do a lot of ad hoc decisions in the in the animation itself that really helps me especially because i'm a one one man operation so most of the visualization is in my head and i don't need to explain it to someone else so i don't have to put it on paper anyway and moho allows me to be very spontaneous in my decisions and move stuff around and then you don't have to redo anything that's the great thing about using bones and and vectors um <clears throat> and new features to come up like the wind feature which i'm using a little bit in the scene when they get sucked to, into the vortex i use the wind feature which is a time saver i don't have to animate all that flapping around of of, of pieces uh vitruvian bones i haven't used yet um, because i think i have if i would use for arms i have all these different hand shapes that are use uh, switch layers for hand shapes and would make things complicated but i could imagine it work well for for non-human characters actually and now my headphones are dying this is great <laughs> and uh, yeah uh, i mean i think that's it that's a huge time saver the, this whole bone animation and, and and the smartphones really that you have these ready-made complex animations that you can reuse over and over is, is the biggest time saver well moho really is is much stronger also than i tried everything else i, I had i used toon boom animate a long long time ago I, I, I dabbled along in, in, in Toon Boom Harmony, didn't find it as flexible and, 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 and versatile as Moho. I used um, uh, Cartoon Animator and found it to be great for explainer videos, for, but for anything else, it's not really great. I even looked into Blender Grease Pencil and it seems to be super, super powerful, but it's also super, super complicated to use. And I've tried like three times to, to understand how to use it and I, I failed every single time and always come back to Moho because it's easy enough to use and it's just more powerful than anything else I know. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And we're actually closer to the end of the webinar. Time flew really fast, but let's close with uh, this question. Uh, because you are a self-taught artist, a uh, self-taught yep. animator also as well, mm -hmm. um, uh, what would you recommend to anybody who started in Moho and who still don't see all of the possibilities that Moho can bring them to their uh, to their idea of creating a TV series? Yeah, so the thing is Moho is incredibly deep uh, and it, it's very daunting at the beginning because many things are, work quite differently than you'd expect from any kind of design software or animation software you might know and <clears throat> it's a bit it can be a bit frustrating because you can't just jump in and play with it and figure it out so what i would recommend is well one thing is um look at tutorials on youtube there are a bunch of great animators who do great step-by-step -step tutorials on how to use more how to rig stuff you can there are paid for tutorials like the bloop animation one this one costs 60 bucks not cheap, but I really can recommend this one. It's great. Then there is um, uh, uh, another thing is is, is that uh, if you come into the forum, I mean, if you go if you go to the Lost Marvel <clears throat> website, there is the forum here. If you if you really don't understand how to do something, you can ask questions. And there is the guy. There is a guy. I forgot his first name. And Dr. Greenlaw. He is an, an absolute treasure trove. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have helped me out so many times. You have given me so many hints. He's a professional animator. 
works at, at DreamWorks and he is he posts every day on the forum helping people out and gives great tips. And I think he too has a bunch of tutorials uh, on how to use Moho. So the best way is to use the software, don't give up and, and try to set a target. I want to create this character and I want to make this character do X and then just keep at it until you figure it out. Uh, it doesn't help just to watch a tutorial without your hands on the software and actually repeating what you're doing because you can't keep it all in your head. You have to do it with your hands and then you learn it. And then you, you, you get the hang of it. Uh, that's what I learned. So just trying to watch tutorials and just watch them without actually doing what they're showing you, it's not going to help you. That's my advice. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Let's wrap it up there uh, mm -hmm. with this great advice to anyone who's participating in this webinar or who will watch the recording. Uh, mm -hmm. So I want to share one last bit of information uh, that for more information, learn more about Moho uh, in our site, mohoanimation.com. Also, as Kilian invited um, to join the forum, you can find the forum link uh, in our website as well. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, so we also invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get a notification. Stay tuned in our social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Moho Animation. And of course, for more information about Kilian, follow him on his social media as Kilian Muster and Instagram, Twitter, and on his website, you can also find more information about the series. So with that, I want to thank again, Kilian, this has been a terrific webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue, for having me. Uh, we also want to thank all of the attendees of today's session, and we'll wait for you in our next webinar. So stay tuned, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye, thank you.